had the pleasure of visiting the Healing Garden, and it is truly a haven for individuals, uh, specifically women impacted by cancer. Uh, Nancy has been a very, very dear friend of mine. Uh, there's no other way to describe Nancy other than that she is a community crusader and who tirelessly works uh, for incredible causes. She's been a longtime Rotarian uh, of the Michelle Valley Club, as she mentioned. So it's such a pleasure to have her, have her visiting us here in Worcester. And it's also a pleasure to have Margaret, who's the executive director of the Healing Garden. Um, Margaret was recently honored as the nonprofit director of the year by the Chamber of Commerce in Middlesex West. So without further ado, uh, we'll have Margaret and Nancy. wonderful people who are making important change in their communities and, and in the world. Um, it's a passion of mine. It's been what I've done in my whole life is to work for others. So it's an honor to be invited to speak here and share with you the work that, that I do. Um, it's an honor to be introduced by Rose. I met Rose and um, I'm thrilled that there's an organization like Ivy Child International that is really so deeply impactful and doing something I mean this in the, in the kindest of ways, it's so simple to be mindful, to teach people to do what they naturally have inside to help themselves. Um, it's part of what we do too, and, we, and I'll explain that further. So it's an honor to have met Rose and to know that she's out in the world making big changes too. Um, and I'm just thrilled to death to have Nancy, a um, fellow Rotarian, um, join our organization. She's only been with us for a little while, but she is a powerhouse. So, um, I'm more and more gravitating towards my 90-hour week, and oh, sure, I could fit better in here too. <laughs> I'm trying to figure that out. But um, these are photographs from the Virginia Thurston Healing Garden. I'll give you a little background. Um, Bill Thurston and his wife Virginia um, lived in Harvard, Mass. They acquired 12 acres of um, untouched land that they then moved into a small um, cottage while they designed a home, their dream home. They raised, four, they built this beautiful home, they raised four children, and then Ginny was diagnosed with um, advanced stage breast cancer. Ginny was a select woman in Harvard. She, uh, she and her husband both were very, very active community um, motivators, um, people of change that just really made the difference in their community. Um, Ginny was a master gardener, and so she, when she was experiencing her treatment, she used gardening as um, an essential tool for her ability to find a good quality of life and to find ways to relieve herself of the stress that she was feeling. They also were ahead of their time, and they participated in their own home and their own family practice to incorporate um, sort of ancient methods of stress reduction and wellness including having monthly massages and acupuncture in their home. Ginny eventually died of her breast cancer, and Bill, in honor and in memory of her, donated two of the eight acres in the center of the property where the old cottage existed, and co-founded the Virginia Thurston Healing Garden in her memory. So it started in 2001. Um, it was a center to provide cancer support for women with breast cancer. Um, we now, 14 years later, have evolved so that we treat all people, all cancer, regardless of gender or diagnosis. So um, just to give you a little insight on um, the population, everybody in this room, for all cancers include, inclusive, um, every one of two men have a risk of developing cancer, every one of three women have a risk of developing cancer in their lifetime. It's a very prominent illness, it's a chronic and eventually life-limiting illness. Um, the five-year survival, that's a, a year out of date now, but the five-year survival for people with cancer is at 67%. So we're moving forward with the ways that we treat cancer going from originally just surgery to surgery and chemotherapy, then various forms of radiation therapy. Now we're into immunotherapy and into genetic targeted therapies so that everybody's individual cancer is being looked at in a biological genomic way so that we're doing targeted therapies. So survival is, is just becoming much longer. But 
there's a lot of side effects and a lot of secondary problems that come because of the interventions, because of the things we do to treat that original form of cancer. The center um, had a capital campaign in 2008. We raised a million dollars to go from a little three-room cottage to expand and renovate to three times the size. The architect that we worked with really understood that um, one of the factors that we believe is really impactful in help helping people heal and deal with illness is an immersion in nature. Every room in the facility is um, sort of exposed to the outdoors, so whether you can be outdoors or not, you have the view of it. Um, the organization is a very small nonprofit. We have an operating budget of $385,000. Um, there's five staff members, but I'm the only full-time person, so when you roll it all together, there's about 3.2 full-time equivalent paid staff. Um, the rest is all done through people <coughs> affiliated with us. So we have 35 licensed, qualified practitioners that provide various forms of healing energy work, um, counseling um, programs and services. 98% um, of the budget is all dependent on individual donors. It's all on contributed income. Um, so our mission is to provide a community of, um, of healing, of hope, and where integra integrative therapies and nature combine <coughs> to improve the quality of life for those that are experiencing cancer. Integrative medicine is the up-and-coming new wave of how um, medical practice is going to be looking towards how do we deal with healthcare issues. Um, the biomedical plan used to be we treat the illness, but we don't look at the whole human being. It's evolved to where we completely understand and there's all kinds of research that proves that there is a, an integral relationship between the mind and the body. The mind definitely affects what is happening inside the body. So it can contribute to illness, but it also can contribute to wellness. And that's what we started 14 years ago. We understood it, Ginny understood it, that there are ways that we can practice interventions that really contribute to holding the body so that the, the illness doesn't progress more than it might on its own, um, and that we can contribute to reducing those factors that that make a, a host for that cancer to continue growing. All of the work we do, all of the program planning that we do, all of the services that support the um, clients is based on research. Uh, we aren't just out there, you know, trying new things because somebody thinks this is really cool. Um, and the benefit of having an integrative approach to a cancer um, diagnosis and using integrative therapies is that it improves the quality of life. It reduces stress, it reduces um, depressions, um, uh, there's a lot of you know, sleep disorders, there are gastrointestinal disorders, there's all kinds of things, um, difficulty eating, swallowing, um, and just the general loss of um, that security that you understand where your life is going, it's out of your control. When we employ the methods that we do, we improve all those things. This is a photograph. That's okay, I'm jumping along here. Um, we have a um, project room where we do group work with our clients, and they can do everything from um, expressive arts to movement classes to sound therapy. We do yoga, tai chi, exercise classes. We'll set it up as a classroom and do didactic lecture style um, informational sessions, really empowering people to understand what their illness is and what they can do to contribute and get control over the ways that they can help themselves through it. Um, around the facility, we've invested with um, volunteers, uh, landscape architects, um, horticultural groups, the Master Gardeners, the Massachusetts Master Gardeners. They've installed a koi fish pond. We have a running brook that runs down through the woods into the koi fish pond. We have a sensory garden. We now have an active horticultural <coughs> therapy garden in the back that is handicapped accessible. So we really are employing all the ways that there is energy and positive um, influence in our lives. 
So we have support groups. Um, we have private practitioner rooms where our clients can work with one-on-one -on -one with a practitioner and get oncology massage. They can get acupuncture, shiatsu, reiki, prepare for surgery. Um, we have a, another room in the facility that we do counseling. We can do individual, couples, family. And all of our providers, um, they're not paid by us. They, they work with us by contract. And that contract says that they agree to pay to provide 50% of their time pro bono. So that allows us to offer our clients these hour-long services on a sliding scale fee system. And these providers are willing to do as little as $30 for the hour to the top, which is 75. At least 75% of our people pay at the bottom of the scale. And our practitioners agree to pro bono the rest of their time. It's the only way that we can provide this. None of these services, other than the counseling, are covered under insurance. What we hope in the future is that um, through more of this research that is happening, and the Osher Center is involved in it, um, which is Harvard Medical School and um, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and many, many of the research institutions in the greater Boston area, they're building a body of evidence that dramatically can show to practitioners who only rely on the data that there is, in fact, ways that we can prove positive income through these mindful interventions with people with illness. Um, So we have access to the Thurston's remaining eight acres that Jeannie and her husband had cultivated. So our clients can wander through there. There's gazebos to sit in. They can take their counseling session out into a gazebo and have an outdoor meeting. Um, our Tai Chi instructors can take people out and they really believe, you know, being barefoot in the grass is really important, that there's energy in the, in the universe and the work that we need to soil, and that we need to really go back to our roots of, you know, being barefoot outside and really removing all those things we think about and reconnecting with the universe and where there is life. And our clients, you know, they come to us when they're newly diagnosed. They come to us when they've been released from being treatment and they're kind of dropped from the medical team and they don't know really how to cope anymore. And they come back to us when they have a recurrence or progressive disease. And what we teach them is that everything in life is it's like the Lion King. You know, we all live, we're all gonna die. And there, we follow what happens in nature. It's the natural process. So figuring out how to look at it differently we are going to die, we have illness, but we also are alive. There's seasons that come and go, the sun rises and sets, we have good days, we have bad days. We work with them to really take away all their thoughts about the negative and put it more in a normalized way. Um, currently, this past year, we had 336 active clients, 72 that were newly added. They're referred to us from all over, all of the medical institutions in the greater Boston area and all of the community hospitals. We get them from Lowell, we get them from Worcester, we get them from downtown, we get them from New Hampshire. They come from all over. Let's just add that this was a fiscal year. Our fiscal year ends at the end of June. And so we had 72 newly by the end of June. Since that time, in the, in the months since July 1st to now, we've increased that number by 80%. With all the people coming in and hearing more about us, um, we have a, just a huge increase in the intake of people that have heard about us, and it's been referred pretty positively. So I just wanted to share that. And, and that's a challenge for us because while we were out in Harvard and people said, "Where's Harvard?" and "Isn't that really too far for me to drive?" they realized there's not another single inst another independent facility that provides this and provides it so that the ones that are the most vulnerable, that have the most difficult cases and the most difficult financial picture in life, they can come to the Healing Garden and get care. We also um, have restricted funds called Fund Need, and so for any client that can't even pay the thirty dollars they're covered under funding, so they're completely subsidized. There's just no one turned away. And that's not available in medical centers. Medical centers do offer some ancillary um, adjunct cancer supportive programs at the medical facilities, but A, the patients don't want to go back there if that's where they go for their treatments and their difficult appointments. They don't want to stay there if they've been there for four hours waiting for their lab works and then their chemo, and then, you know, they want to get in the car and go home and beat the traffic. So. A facility like ours is truly a haven. It's a place, it, you know, most people get there in a half an hour, 40 minutes, and they stay. 
they do an appointment, then they do a program, then they might go into the garden room and eat lunch and talk with other folks. So um, it's really essential that we're there to support this piece that really allows us to help a person go back to their community, to go back to a quality of life where they can care for their kids, they can return to work once they get off of disability, they can return to being a positive and hopeful person and see a future. Maybe a future with cancer, but a future. So that's our goal, is to help bring people back to a functioning level where they're active in their community, in their church, in their rotary, at work, so all those things. That. And no one else can provide that. The you more that we get more clients, mind. though, yeah. it just means we have to do more fundraising. Because there's no revenue stream off these people. There's no making any money off of them. And that's why the hospitals don't provide it. It's a lost leader. This is the one that Nancy was alluding to, is that all of a sudden, um, we've been doing a lot of networking around to make sure that the underserved really know that this is out there for them, and it's caught on. All of the facilities now hand out our brochures and tell people, so we have um, a huge influx in clients, which is great, because the more that they're there together, they help each other, they learn from one another, and they go home and have resources with one another behind the scenes when they're not with us. But it means that you know we've got to figure out how to find caring for them. Uh, we recently were um, selected by Leslie University to have an internship program. They have a Master's of Expressive Therapy, and so we are an approved location for those students to do their um, second year internship. And so that's fabulous because we have an intern that is with us. Um, a couple days a week that costs us nothing but helps us with more um, service hours for our clients. And we have Nancy, who we have an angel donor. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with TED Talk, but I shared with a donor of ours a TED Talk that was pretty provocative that was talking about um, how wrong it is that our culture believes that um, for profit should invest in themselves. That, that they take their profits and they invest and, and they have strategy in the future and nonprofits are slapped on the hand for investing in themselves. And that's just wrong. You can't and you can only go so far if you don't invest in yourself. And this donor decided that the healing garden had gotten as far as it could, but without investing in how we're going to figure out sustainability around fundraising and funding this wonderful resource for our communities that we would eventually close. So we acquired me. Well, we also got some, some UMass Medical students. UMass Medical School has also, we have a really great relationship with the palliative care team. And they came out and asked if they could use our facility and our staff to have a team building workshop where they also got um, trained by our group in mindfulness and how to use various um, integrative approaches to um, improved well-being and so the students also were learning about um, massage. Uh, Pam Turchi, she's one of our 35 therapists. This is in the individual treatment room. Um, everything at the Healing Garden was donated. So our massage tables that are heated, our bookshelves, our desks, our computers, there isn't a stitch of anything that we have spent money on. All the money that we raise goes to providing the services and keeping the place available for the clients that come. We had a three-year um, grant from the Kohlberg Foundation for $300,000, which allowed us to have an artist in residence. She was there full-time. Um, she's a beautiful artist, and she uses poetry and painting to help people learn to see things from a new perspective. Um, it, She's a two-time cancer survivor. She also lost her husband to cancer. She went on sabbatical after that and um, has come back recently. What that also allowed us to do was to take Candace and our model of integrative cancer support into Fitchburg, Lemonster, Fitchburg, Lemonster, one other place, um, where we modeled what we do at the Healing Garden, and that resulted in um, the Simon Heard Cancer Center that was founded there. So um, we just think it's, you know, there's no competition around what we're doing. We're hoping that um, as healthcare moves forward and um, we're trying to reduce costs, that they have 
what was required to happen in a hospital inpatient happens there, what happens in the ambulatory setting happens there, and what we can do in the other affiliated programs to support those two things is how it will happen. So the right kind of care at the right price in the right places is how the model should spin out, and that will help control our health care costs. We find that our patients spend less time going back to the emergency room and have less readmittance because they're getting the supportive care they get from us. And that's really important. There's easy ways to do that, not to just leave people hanging out on their own, suffering, not knowing what to do for themselves. We do a prayer bead class. We do pottery. Um, so the fundraising that we do, we have our annual fund. Um, there's a third party fundraising group called the Just Cause Walk. They're a breast cancer walk. They fundraise for Mass General and for the Healing Garden. Donors choose. Um, in there, we have a 3.5 mile walk that's in the middle of that walk, and um, all of that money comes to the healing garden. So, Nancy, I think, is hoping that we get Rotarians to think about um, putting together teams and banks and vendors around just to help you know, keep some of the community money in the community where it's really needed. Um, we also have an upcoming River um, Valley Winery in Bolton is a wonderful um, New England winery that makes terrific um, wine and craft beer. I think they call it the Bolton Beer Works. We're having the Heart of Winter. The Bear Hill Band will be there. We're having raffle items. It's a lot of fun. It's February 12th. Um, hmm? Oh, 6.30 to 9. Um, beer Hill Band is, um, they do folk rock from the 60s and 60s. 60s and 70s, but a little bit toned down, so um, very, very fun. And our new event that we're <coughs> going to um, have for the first time in September is a Ride to Thrive. It's a bicycle century, a metric century, and half century, so it's a figure eight, and it's in Neshoba Valley, starting from um, Harvard, which is like the premier area for bike riding. So if you know we ride, people who like to ride, um, point them our way. We're going to be doing that in September. This is Bill Thurston. Um, Bill's still alive, he's 93. He lives out in California. He writes me an email about once a week with his thoughts upon awakening. Um, he is a gentleman that was um, raised during the Depression. His father abandoned the family. Uh, they had nothing. His mother worked three jobs to raise two boys. And some community member um, who knew him as a young man understood that this man was pretty darn smart and he funded him to MIT. And he um, later went on to be the GM of GenRat. Very successful life, very philanthropic. Um, gave a lot of money to start out the healing garden and donated a lot. And that's Jenny, the picture of Jenny on our wall behind him. We have uh, almost 50 volunteer gardeners. All the property around us, around our building, is maintained by volunteers and master gardeners and garden clubs. Um, and so, we have an opening of the garden and a fall closing, and all summer long volunteers come and water and help us take care of it. And so the feedback from the clients is always incredible. Their stories are heartwarming. Um, you can see they just are so grateful. And that's the thing I think that is the most special about the Healing Garden, is that there's so much gifting going on <coughs> over there. Um, between volunteers and donors and people who just come and see what happens and they get involved. It's infused, I think, in the building, in the land, in all of the what's happening over there. This is the back sensory garden that is accessible, handicapped accessible. It was designed to have the five elements of energy, water, the sun, the air, the earth. Um, this curved bench here was a gift from a 13-year-old boy. He made it on his own. His mother was a client of ours, and she passed away, leaving him and his twin sister when they were nine. And so when he was eligible to do his Eagle Scout project, he came to me on a snowy day, and he said, I, I can start now. <laughs> what do you need? And I said, oh, you know, a bench. You know, like I was thinking a two-seater little square bench or something. And so he made this lovely curved bench that goes all the way over, you can't see it in the picture, um, and dedicated it to his mom. And it just repeats, you know, there's just all this gift in every piece. And so this 
go. We have these miracles of crocuses in the snow. That's um, Betsy Tyson Smith and Bill um, left, who co-founded this. Sarah Hindle in the middle, a community member that has been a huge, generous supporter. That was at the ribbon cutting ceremony. Um, and this is what we have on a plaque in our, our center in the midst of winter I found in the, the invincible summer. And that's really what we try to help our clients see is that in the middle of all of this you will find that there are some silver linings. And that's a piece of art that Candace did. Be joyful though you've considered all of that. So do you want to add anything? No, I think you, that you've done a great job. I do want to talk quickly about the, um, we all have fundraisers within the Rotary. I, I'm working on another one, the Brew Fest. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Brew Fest that we had done in Hudson last year. With, uh, we shared it with the Hudson Rotary and the Shoba. So now I'm wearing two hats as far as this is concerned. And I'd love all of you to go to the healinggarden.net if you'd like to and look at our various fundraisers that we have. One of the ones that she discussed was the upcoming one, February 12th, winery. It's really fun. It's, we have auction items. Um, you can drink wine. You can listen to great music. You can drink beer. It's a great purpose, and it's $75. So it's pretty reasonable. The food's pretty great. And I'm not encouraging this, but it is a bit of an open bar. I didn't say that out loud. But, um, and that's just one way that you can help with us. And also the walk. Um, the Just Cause We Can Walk is a three and a half mile walk the, on Saturday, the day of, the, right in the middle of the three day larger walk. And we're trying to get teams together of people. So I'll be sending information out to the different Rotary clubs. And so I'd love to know if anybody has any questions about putting a team together, what it's all about. We can certainly do that. Very shortly, we'll have something on our webpage that will give you much more uh, uh, direction about what it is that we're doing. <coughs> I wanted to thank you so much for spending the time with us, and please go to the healinggarden.net and look at it, because it's pretty fabulous. And if any of you want to come and visit, you know you're always welcome. The door's always open. So thank you. disease. 
really, really different groups of people in different things. We have a young women's group. They're moms. They've got five, six, seven-year-olds. They've got moms that likely that is, they might not make it to see these kids get to college. So they know what the whole two different things. So um, we really try to help put people together that can help each other. So. Yeah. Is there a way for you to bill like insurance to get yeah. some of the money? So um, one of the things, we are a educational nonprofit. We have a licensed social worker who also has a master's in theology. She does our intake. So as a social work consult, under her license, we could bill if we were a medical facility or a mental health facility, which we're not. So we've been trying to think about how to partner with a medical facility because we need to have the um, accreditation and the regulatory body, like Joint Commission for most hospitals is a regulatory body, so that we would be um, audited for our practice and our professionalism and our quality of what we do. But as yet, we don't have that. That has been a goal of ours, is to try to find that relationship with a medical facility that um, will adopt us as a off-site. But until that point, we can't. Um, and that would be the only piece, because most insurers yet do not cover um, acupuncture or oncology massage or, or expressive art therapy. Under people's mental health benefit, they can fill for the counseling, yeah. which our counselors do. But that, that money goes between the counselor and the client. It doesn't come to the 